Check one, two, check one, two. How's everybody doing? Welcome to the stream. Sorry for the late start. Just a busy day as usual. How's everybody doing? Uh, let me get this out of the way. Boom. There we go. Oops. Okay. Welcome. All 31 of you. Where's everybody from? Let me give me, give me a shout out. Let me know where you're, uh, what country or what city you're in. Let me know how you're doing. Everyone's having a good day or evening. All right, we're going to be focusing on detailing the anatomy at this point because I think the poses are pretty much there. No, little tweaks will happen here and there, but I think we're uh, I think we're good to go. Eusterius, what's up, sir? That looks sweet, thank you. Hannibal X. I got a bunch of stuff on my desk. I've got to, I got to get this whole thing reorganized. My favorite streamers. <laughs> Hope I'm as good as I grow. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Hannibal. <laughs> How old are you? And you say when you grow up. <laughs> oh, man. What's a smart subdiv do? Um, never use that option. Yeah, it's not native to um, ZBrush, by the way. Smart subdiv, you'll see a few things in here, maybe just a few, which are not... Um, they don't come with ZBrush, so I added a plugin. So it's um, I think you get it for free, and then there's also like a paid version, which uh, it's like a few bucks. I think it's like ten dollars or something or five. Excuse me, not much at all. Um, but it's called Ryan's Tools. So if you go to you search Google for Ryan's Tools, um, on Gumroad. So it's on that site. So if you come over here, you, it's a very simple, like you have a little readme file and an image to show you like where to drop the folders into. It's very, very simple, very user-friendly. Uh, so plugins, Ryan's tools right here. And so smart subdiv, uh, I'll show you what smart subdiv does. It's great. I love it. Um, let me just get a regular old cube here. So we've got just a plain old cube. Um, Sorry, just replying to a quick text. Um, sorry. So, uh, so here's a cube, and let me make it a 3D poly. Actually, let me reduce the uh, amount of polygons on it, so we have like just a cube. Initialize, and a division here. Let's bring this down. All right, so that's pretty bare bones. It's a pretty super simple cube. Make poly mesh. Okay, now if you want to divide this normally, 
will have smooth subdivision on, right? So then you just hit subdivide and it starts to become cylindrical, right? That's the normal way this this type of cube subdivides. But if we undo that, and then we turn, we use smart subdivision. So we still have smooth subdivision on, because if you have smooth subdivision off, all you do is to subdivide. So I just divided once, but it doesn't update the poly frame in real time for some reason. So now if I turn on and off, you see now there's subdivision, right? But no smoothing. So undo that, we turn on smooth subdivision on, and now we do smart subdivide. And that looks a little weird, but you can see that's basically keeping the volume, right? It's not smooth subdividing normally will constrict, it'll, it'll like shrink, right? It'll contract, it'll contract. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, <laughs> so now with smooth subdivision, you keep your volume. So it subdivides more like what you'd see when you do subdivision in Maya, when you just do, you know, your smooth subdivision, um, which is pretty normal in, uh, in Maya. Oh, this is my kid for my short. Um, let's solo it out so he doesn't have any clothes on. There we go. Um, so, like, for instance, uh, I'm trying to think of if I could show you with his clothes, or did I already decimate that? No, I think I decimated that. Yeah. No. Uh, no, these wouldn't be good examples. Yeah, because this was just a static model. Um, no, Keanu's head. No. Um <laughs> I'm trying to think what would be a good example here. Oh yeah, I saw this fiber mesh from last time. Let's delete all that. Um, anyway, that's a general idea though. It just keeps your volume. That's all it does really. So smooth up subdivide is great for that. Keeps the volume of mass you have going on. And it's a lot better in my opinion. I use it, um, I mean, sometimes I want smooth subdivision to reduce, I don't mind it like constricting a little bit and sort of bringing things down, contracting things. Um, but there's times where you want the volume to remain intact. You want it to be exactly in the same place, but just become smoother, not smoother and shrink. So during the times when you have something shrink, when you subdivide and you hate that, smooth subdivision, um, smart subdivision, excuse me, is the uh, the route you want to go. So that's what it's there for. Um, does that make sense? Um, Hannibal is 50. <laughs> Uh, it's a mixture without smooth and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Artistically, I'm at that point where I need to break through the ceiling. I hear you. See how Keanu's head full screen. Oh, you want to see Keanu's head? It's not done. I mean, it's really not done, but it's definitely a work in progress. But I was happy with where it was coming along, but it's still... He needs sunglasses. It's a total, like, angry smirk because it was actually matched up with the... um. <laughs> it looks it looks so awkward from these angles. It's not finished at all, so please be gentle on criticism. But it was the uh, expression he was making in the Matrix when it's it's a pose I'm doing from when he does that triple kick at the end of the lobby scene. So it's like the the, the crescendo to that whole ramp up to them, you know, assaulting the uh, federal building to get in and rescue Morpheus. Um, so it's that that super penultimate moment of him in midair, just one leg coming into the uh, to the guard, flipping the guard over. Um, so it's at his peak of, of his jump. So it's probably the most, one of the most badass, you know, sequences in the whole film. And, uh, I loved it. So I figured it's about time. I love the matrix. If you can no. tell, Hey, no. no, 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 it's okay. Sorry. He, uh, my friend just came over and I left the door open for her and, uh, he's barking. Um, no barking. Go say hi. Be quiet. Be nice um no no it's okay shush sorry um so anyway that's what the head's for the body and everything else is a bit easier i'm dude it's okay no i'm sorry one second here Sorry about that. He's uh, he's an old dog. Poor guy's arthritic and crotchety and irritable. And um, he's uh, a jealous pup. So when someone comes over, he knows they might get some attention from me in any way, shape, or form. So he barks. 
Uh, so anyway, that's my corgi. He's a possessive pup. Anyway, sorry. So yeah, that's where the the head is from. It's it's still a work in progress. I haven't touched in a while, but it's definitely on the right course. And um, he'll definitely look better with sunglasses on and everything. Like you know, he'll match pretty close to what his expression was in that one scene. Um, so anyway, uh, Michael Madsen. <laughs> It's a puppy. No, he's he's an old dog. He's uh, he's an old corgi. Unfortunately, he's getting up there. Um, more of your speech during when the red dress is iconic, especially in regards to these times. Yeah, tell me about it. Tell me about it. There's so many parallels in uh, in any any. I mean, I've been watching a bunch of movies, and a part of me wants to be like recommended watching for the New World Order. <laughs> <laughs> terrible i mean i don't want to get too political or anything but it's like good god some of the some of the extreme rhetoric that's being tossed around by the media is just that it's too extreme it's too polarizing if we got to come together we got to come together and realize people have different opinions and they're not they're not you know people aren't people who have different opinions than you doesn't mean they're hateful bigots it just means they're different um there's a lot of there's a lot of people in the middle ground Think of it like a football field, right? You have your end goals, and those are the extremists, the whack jobs that are very loud. They're amplified by the media, but they're not by any means the vast majority of us, which are all kind of somewhere in the middle of the field, either left or right, or in the center. And we should all be able to get along just fine. And those crazy voices should be the ones that are disregarded. But I believe should still be allowed to say their craziness. Just don't incite violence, right? But go ahead and say whatever you want to say. Anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of movies I've been looking at where I'm just like recommended watching for uh, <laughs> for current times. Um, yeah, it's sad and, and it's, it's funny. You have to laugh, otherwise you cry, I guess, at this point, right? I mean, oh, I just hope that, uh, I don't know, I just pray things get back to a more normal time, a more uh, peaceful, normal, harmonious time. But we'll see. Hopefully things get back to a more sane time. Um, <laughs> I was just watching um, First Night the other night. Uh, I haven't seen it in years. And my sister loved that movie. And I always was kind of like the younger brother. Just kind of, okay, we'll watch this. It's kind of cool, whatever. And yet now I'm just seeing all these parallels. Or um, watching Far and Away. I watched that the night before with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman where they first met. And... Uh, just like man the american dream the original like immigration stories right and those coming over from the uk and uh i guess he was irish and uh was she british i think she was supposed to be british right I forget but uh great movie fantastic movie um classic great score to john williams Whew. beautiful music beautiful score um yeah good times yeah yeah morpheus man i love the matrix man the first matrix is a masterpiece of a film um it's great and i met um is it jeff jeff darrow see it's so terrible i forget his name half the time i can see his face so vividly but he's the concept artist who worked on the matrix like all the matrix films and if you watch the behind the scenes like in the matrix revisited when they go and talk to all these different behind the scenes artists he's one of the major ones they speak to and i met him at comic-con in san diego when i was demoing for wacom there three years ago i want to say now i guess it's three years ago or four years something like that got my picture with him i look terrible so i didn't post it <laughs> so egotistical of me i guess or narcissistic i should just post it um but it was cool. It was really cool to meet him. It was really cool to talk with him and just pick his brain a little bit and just, just be able to thank him, too, for such incredible visionary art and ideas and um, the work he put into it. Because so much of his concept art that he drew for The Matrix transferred directly into the film. Like, it's like his iconic framing of certain things and designs. You go back and forth and it's like it matches like pretty much one to one. I mean, you know marginally marginal changes as the real world will demand but man they got it so close to his vision of certain things for a lot of it i mean even like um i think he designed the um sentinels as well you know the squiddies uh, come in and uh harass and kill people and uh man it's just it was so cool to, it was so cool to meet him and just shake his hand and just say dude thank you for thank you for all the work and inspiration you did man your, your stuff was 
burned into my memory forever now. And uh, I freaking love The Matrix. So yeah, that was really, that was really cool. I'm just looking at my arm here, just trying to, because my arms look so much like this now. I got to get back in shape. I'm so out of shape. For those who don't know, like last year I uh, I had COVID, I'm pretty sure, at the beginning of the year. And it was horrible. And then it turned into uh, bacterial pneumonia. And then, so I basically was sick for like two and a half months straight, solid. And then right after I got better, that was like the end of spring, the middle of spring, I guess, when I got fully back to normal. And then right at the beginning of summer, I uh, I tore my soleus, which is the uh, muscle that's deep inside your calf muscle. So it runs right against your fibula. So it's in the, in like... You kind of have these two heads that form like tubular heads on your calves that form the, the shape of your calf, the bulk of it. Behind them, against your bone, is this deep muscle called the soleus. And that's what I tore. It, it was painful. Uh, it was horrible. So I, I stupid, stupid accident. It was the dumbest thing. It's always that, right? It's never like some dramatic story. It was just I was looking at a Beamer. A nice, a nice BMW at a stop sign, and I didn't pay attention that I wasn't. I was on a scooter of all things, my own scooter. It's embarrassing, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I wasn't really paying attention. I was being a little lackadaisical, just like, oh yeah, I'm on, I'm on point and on in line with the ramp for the sidewalk. Nope, it was just enough to the left of the ramp where it starts to curve up to the curb again, it starts to like you know flow up, and it stopped the it stopped the freaking scooter so hard. I launched over it, did a whole like freaking cartwheel, but my right leg, I ride goofy kind of just like snowboarding right leg forward. And so all my body rotated over it like 180, but my right leg stayed as firmly planted. So everything else rotated over and just hyper extended and then tore the muscle a bit. Oh, man, it was horrible. And then I just flipped over and just landed hard on my back and I kind of carried the I'm lucky it didn't hit my head. Like I rolled onto my forearm, back onto my shoulder, and then onto my. So luckily my head was fine because I could have really been a vegetable or something if I would have struck my head on the concrete the right way. Um, God. So I lucked out in that sense. I uh, count your blessings, but man, it wasn't fun. So that just ruined my my year. I mean, as far as like my health went, as far as being able to run, work out because I love running and I, I love kickboxing and, and practicing taekwondo and all that stuff. Um, that just destroyed all of that pretty much, you know, I was very much more sedentary last year or so. I just feel like, I feel like skinny fat. I hate that term, but I feel kind of like that now. It's, uh, hilarious, but, um, not, but anyway, so yeah, last year was a wash, man. That just, ugh, that just sucked. So I'm just getting back on the horse now, only now able to do a little jog and not have any pain in the leg. I was doing all the like raising it and putting it on ice, taking tons of NSAIDs, you know, anti-inflammatory stuff. Um, you know, eating collagen with protein and all this other stuff to just help my muscle heal faster and just trying not to re-injure myself by hobbling around, walking my dog and having to carry him home a lot because the poor guy's arthritic. So, and now he's starting to develop some hip dysplasia. So it's just, uh, at least I'm healthy enough to like carry him around again because he needs it. I got to get him like some sort of little doggy wagon or something. Uh, first world problems, you know, but still it's, um, it wasn't fun. I got to say 2020 was the year from hell. Uh, but thankfully bits of life are for me are returning somewhat back to normal. It's still very not, but, um, physically at least health wise, I'm, Getting back on the horse, going to get back in shape. So this will be my physique again sooner than later. <laughs> right now it's more, uh, what did Cartman say? I'm not fat, I'm festively plump. <laughs> it's just jolly fat. It's not gross fat. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not morbidly obese or anything. But man, it's been a struggle to get back. Get back to where I was. It's like, it's got to be disciplined, man. It's all about discipline. Discipline and consistency. It's just working out's all about consistency. It's just like saving your money, investing it. It's all about doing the same thing consistently and being wise about timing and all that. Sorry, missing a bunch of chat. What? What's everyone saying? 
Um, da, 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 da. Been around a long time. If FOS equals equal, all treat the same. Otherwise, create some more equal on the other side, which basically is an equal. Yep, uh, it's true. Jeff Darrow, great. If you like him, check out Hard Boiled. I know I keep hearing about that. Thank you. I need it. I forgot. I got to check out Hard Boiled for sure. I know that's like an iconic, classic work of art. Um, muscle damage recoverable. Once a nerve is damaged, it can't be fixed. Yeah, I mean, my muscle damage was enough where it wasn't like major nerves were were torn to anything. I mean, at least deep inside, it didn't it didn't change anything. I mean, it's still a little tender, just a little bit, just a little. Um, but I mean, it's at least it's not swelling up like it was anymore because it was still swelling up moderately, consistently for excuse me a while. So uh, yeah, it's just finally getting back to a more normal state now. But yeah, muscles take forever to heal, man. Because we it's especially in the leg because it's like even though you don't use them, you try not to try to stay off it. You still you know you're still using them in some way often if you're ambulating anywhere. Um, yeah. What is that? Shy. What does it say? Uh, Shalom and the cowboy is fun. Is that uh, is that another Jeff Darrow graphic novel? Um, Riz Wamishin, what's up? Uh, oh yeah. Dislocated my knee three times as well. Ah, uh, that's terrible. Hard muscle to tear. Hope you're well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Things are. Thank you. Yeah, guys. Yeah, definitely getting better. Um. Man, right leg, uh, ligaments, right leg, torn apart, could not walk for, could not walk for weeks. Uh, lose, uh, seven months, regulate themselves, yeah. Um, or re, what do you say, re-glue, re-glue themselves, yeah. Need a gym injury, what? made a gym injury once. Forearm, made my life miserable. Just a wrong grab with a barbell, and I lost the balance. Couldn't deal with my hand properly for a long time, oof. The kneecap though keeps sliding on. Oh, that's not fun. Sorry. Just plop them in an old radio flower wagon. <laughs> that's what I've had some friends suggest. Yeah. Going to suggest uh, uh, bass rootins workout. Be tough. You can throw a knee. Stero as well. Okay, Sholin Cowboy. I have to look that up. Very over the top. Just him having fun. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Um, MMA workout, audio tapes on Spotify. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I'll check that out for sure. Yeah, I mean, because I would be mixing. I mean, I took Taekwondo in college for a while. And uh, and then I would just mix it with some Krav Maga and some things I would just look up on YouTube. After like four years of Taekwondo, um, you know, I felt decent. I felt confident. I mean, I, I did it partially just to get in shape. And also because I, it was right around the time after the Matrix came out. So all of us were into like martial arts and all of us were enjoying that. And just were like, why not? So we were all in college together, a bunch of my buddies and I. And um, I started college in like 99. Um, and, uh, you know, well, 2099, I was taking AP courses um, in college at, at, in 99. But then I uh, it was formerly a freshman in 2000. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we took Taekwondo. A bunch of my friends and I in college took Taekwondo together. And um yeah, but then I mix it with Krav Maga later, just as a way to, yeah, stay in shape, but also I'd like to know how to defend myself and be able to handle myself. Uh, just feel confident in that area. So, so yeah, so I've, I've definitely kind of done my own kind of incorporation of MMA, but uh, I guess I was sort of doing that before that was a thing. I mean, I classified it as anything. I just was like, oh, I'll just blend together techniques that make sense that will help you survive if someone were to attack you. Well. Yeah. So would always uh would always keep up on that stuff. It was always fun. And um just a great way to work out too, you know. I mean just I and I advocate for everyone to learn martial arts, I think, in some way. Some self defense, I think it's just it's wise for people. Especially now in these times, man, where some people get desperate and they just want they just want to mug people, man, and uh some of them get violent, you know. I mean it's like nothing's worth your life, give everything away if someone tries to take it, but uh if they try to assault you or if you're a lady the nose, the neck, or the nuts. That's it. <laughs> Just take care of it quickly. <laughs> Go for the eyes. Whatever, man. Um, stay safe out there. It's crazy.
crazy, crazy. I mean, even around here, man, in Manhattan Beach, we've had some incidents recently. It's crazy. Got to be careful. Got to be careful out there. <laughs> oh, Q, there's a horn. <laughs> I don't know if you guys don't know if they picked up on the mic. It's just angry road ragers, road ragers out here a bit. Um, <laughs> I swear, I live off of a main road, and so there's a lot of traffic at times where rush hour or just what have you people get very aggressive with the horn it gets annoying kind of looking to move somewhere a little bit more quiet i uh i miss living i live in an apartment complex i miss living in a home because before i moved here i lived in a, a nice home a nice little townhouse and uh far off the main roads and just quiet you know really quiet i, I miss the quiet I mean, it's not, it's definitely not as loud now as it used to be because of far less traffic because of lockdown and all that. But, um, but yeah, I, uh, I miss a quiet environment. I like a nice quiet house. I don't like having people above me and beside me. Definitely made some concessions to move to LA, which, uh, I miss. I've always missed, but now more than ever, I guess. Whereas it's like all of us who are in the arts agreed, like you could work from home, you could work from anywhere all the jobs that we've worked on for all the time we've been in the industry now. I mean, in at least, you know, since the internet's had broadband speeds. So it's been quite a while that we all think we could have worked from home, but now the pandemic, um, that's all we can do really for, for the most part. And so now I'm always considering like, Hmm, it's hard to leave living near the ocean. That's the thing. That's hard. It's really hard to turn away from that. Cause I love, I love this environment. I love the weather. But if I had to pick somewhere, probably Texas, I guess. It's like so hot. <laughs> I'd have to live near a body of water, I guess, near a lake or something. Somewhere where you get a little bit more temperate, right, weather, and uh, you can jump in the water, you know. Um, I'm a bigger fan of the ocean than lakes, though. But I don't know. I don't know. I think the best thing about the ocean is just the beaches, you know, and just also the community, man, like living near the beach, you just get a different vibe from people, man, the energy and the way people carry themselves. I mean, Manhattan Beach, Redondo Beach, Hermosa Beach, they're all basically vacation destinations, you know, so to live here is, is a real privilege. It's great. It's wonderful. Um, so that's why it's hard to like really think about moving somewhere else. Anyway, sorry, I'm just babbling. I'm just ruminating. Does anybody have uh, <laughs> does anybody have any questions about uh, ZBrush at all? I'm sorry, just just going off of my thing. Um, used to hand wash his long straps. Look, <laughs> I go along the knuckles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, better from USC, bald headed guy, very humorous. Look them up on YouTube as well. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Thanks, Hannibal. Uh, lived in the studio for two years. Oof. Yeah, studio studio apartments are rough. This isn't a studio. But, uh, this is a nice two bedroom spot. But um, so I use a second bedroom as my office for three D printing and all that stuff, which is great. But um, it's nice to keep all that separate, you know. Um, really quiet aside from the pool and some trees, football fields. Yeah, yeah, we have a pool here too, but I never use it because I think. Stagnant water's very unattractive to me. I'd rather, I like, I prefer the ocean as opposed to like sitting bodies of water. Um, and the pool, we just have, we have teenagers in here and like little kids. And so I'm like, eh, I don't think I need to hop in the pool. <laughs> I'll go to the ocean. Who knows which one's cleaner. That's funny. The salt water, I just feel is like a better, a better uh, sterilizing and the sunlight. You know, that's great. But anyway, um, ducks gathering at the pool. <laughs> that's hilarious uh michigan all seasons awesome oops never mind i keep forgetting i'm supposed to sell it as a bad place ah that's funny yeah i grew up in pennsylvania man so i'm neighbors it was not too far from michigan i grew up in pa had all the seasons i really don't miss the winter i do miss like the beauty of snowfall like the first you know few hours or the first day or two when it's just fresh snow and it's just beautiful and quiet and you can step outside and it sounds like you're indoors almost because the sound doesn't echo or to carry very far and so it has that weird kind of, you know, subdued sound when you speak and you're interacting with other people, um, snowball fights. Those were always fun. But then the next two days, three days, it just turns into this like black sludge and you're just like, ah, and then 
black ice and you're slipping on the sidewalk and nah i'm, I'm good i'm done with winters <laughs> i want to live somewhere warm for the rest of my time on earth if i have any choice and they say in it um uh what else we got here uh plan on getting my pistol permit soon get to the range need to do anything here though covers concealed and open nice yeah i've been looking at picking up a firearm i haven't yet actually i go shooting every now and then for sure i like i like knowing how to use a gun for sure but i actually don't own one yet um other choice weapons but, <laughs> but no guns yet uh i feel comfortable with ccing though yeah it's weird right it feels it feels weird um i would think um what intensity do you use um the form soft brush seems to make hard edge easy when sculpted faces um the form soft brush i think i leave the form soft brush at like three yeah i usually leave it at three and i just do alt to like add or subtract with the uh, soft edge brush yeah um uh haven't been swimming in ages yeah first snow at night yep yep exactly really beautiful the silent snow yeah hear snowflakes touching the snow on the ground <laughs> yeah those are those picturesque like those quintessential moments that we, we i think we all have burned into our memory as children or whenever you first experience you know snowfall it's great um but yeah, but then as you become an adult and you start driving, if, if you've had it your whole life, then you're like, uh, don't need more snow. Don't need any more snow. Uh, driving and it's horrible. And the thing is, in states where it's like uh, normal, they'll expect you to get to work with like everyone else did. If like a bunch of people can make it into work or unless like the state doesn't declare like a weather emergency, you're just expected to come into work. Hydroplaning your way there and dangerous run like... Hell no, man. Like, <laughs> it's not worth your life. Like, come on. I mean, if you're like essential staff at the hospital, when I used to work at the hospital, I, I mean, I got it. Like, yeah, it's like, hey, you know, our jobs help people's lives. I worked in the ER for a couple of years. So it's like, yeah, obviously our work is essential no matter what. <laughs> Rain, sleet, snow. It's like you got to get in there to, to be part of the team that helps someone who is in an accident, you know, or any other kind of a car accident or not, you know, any kind of life threatening problem. But other than that, um, I remember like when I was a teenager, I think, or when I was like a kid, I was working in uh, retail for a while, you know, and I worked at like Gap, I worked at Banana Republic, uh, GameStop, you know, and uh, just for the discounts, of course, as a teenager and as a kid, I was just like, hey, get my Sega Dreamcast cheap, <laughs> get get my Gap clothes cheap, get my Banana Republic clothes, you know, cheaper, and it's still pretty expensive, but um, for what they were, you know, but um, I, I, I think I cared more about fashion when I was a, definitely when I was a teenager and younger, very young adult than I, I do now. It's the older I get, the less I care. I mean, I still like to just look nice, but you know. I think comfort especially now more than ever like comfort's way more important than uh keeping up refined refined appearances but i think i built up such a decent wardrobe working at all those stores that it's like even my like loungy clothes can often be like eh, some decent articles you know stuff that looks fine when you step out unless i'm just doing the sweatpants thing which isn't i don't know i don't feel like comfortable walking around in sweats it still feels kind of weird usually stuff i sleep in right you know, or like go running if it's like cold, but never cold here anymore. Anyway, sorry, again, just blabbering. Um, <laughs> what else is going on? Um, pretty when you look outside and there's food out, not so good when you have to go anywhere. And there's food, I think you mean snow, right? Food? <laughs> Slattering ice, yeah, it's never fun. Uh, would you prefer summer over winter anytime? Yeah, of course, oh yeah, summer always. I think the ideal really is more like the end of spring, right? That's really the ideal. Or maybe like even mid spring, because then you have like your it's kind of like right now, it's weirdly warm right now in LA. Um, even Manhattan Beach standards, it's bizarrely warm. Um, it was like 82 the other day. I posted on Instagram. It's like crazy warm. 82 Fahrenheit. That's like 27.8 Celsius. 
Um, that's warm for us during this time of year. January usually is not this warm, even for LA standards. It's not, it's never like this. Um, yeah, so. Almost an hour to work when I worked at Walmart. It was the only one they expected to come in regardless of weather. Not the people who drove. Uh, bold man age now. I have to be cautious on surfaces that make me use those immortal words. I I can't get up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hear you, dude. <laughs> We're all getting older, man. It's a one-way ticket. We're all in the same direction. It's just some of us are in front, some of us are behind, but we're all going one direction. Celsius, deduct 10 American points. <laughs> Celsius, uh, what did I say? Cent what's, uh, centigrade, right? Celsius, centigrade, Celsius. Using the word Celsius to <laughs> um, What brush are you using instead of damn standard? Oh, I'm using uh, Slash. I'm using the Slash 3 brush. That's right here. If you can see. Slash 3. That's what I'm using to cut in. I love Slash 3. That's why it's out here on my, like, you know, whatever this is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, so it's like my 12 most used brushes I kind of just have right there on the side. So I can just quickly, quickly use them. Can't see it on my phone. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm using the damn standard. I mean, I'm not using the damn standard. I'm using slash three. Uh, but damn standard's good too. The damn standard. So I'll have a. I'm gonna admit I'm cheating with a analog solution. I have a great artist anatomy book right here. Um, for those who want to know. It's a classic. This is iconic. This has been around for forever. It's an Atlas of Anatomy for Artists by Fitz Scheider. There you go. Um, was that backwards for you guys? That's backwards, isn't it? Crap. Let me flip that for you. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't realize my video feed was flipped. Let me flip it again. There we go. There we go. Eh. Derp. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, this is the book. It is a classic. It's been around forever. Uh, if you want a great anatomy book for reference, definitely pick it up. It's phenomenal. Um, so that's what I have just off off camera. Uh, type a name for us, please. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of furniture rearranging. Why? Um, sorry, I'll be, uh, so it's, Okay, so that's the uh, that's the anatomy book. I'm sure you can find it online. I think, if I'm not mistaken, people have even PDF scanned this thing in because it's so classic and so old, um, but not old in like a bad way. I just mean it's just it's been around for forever and it's such a great reference. So I, my suspicion is, if I'm not mistaken, I even feel like I saw years ago because I was definitely more in circles of 2D artists for a while and concept artists before I really got heavy into 3D. And uh, they would always, I think, be sharing around a PDF of this because it was hard to find and sold out a lot of places. But still, it doesn't... Having something on screen versus physically having a book, there's just still no comparison. Um, I mean, it's great if you actually want to trace an image or something, you know, if you want to actually use it superimposed in uh, in a 3D package. But just be able to have your reference, you know, so you could be working offline 
just to be able to look at it, you know, and not have to have it on a screen or anything. It's just, it's great. I love, I love physical books, but ironically, because my, my life revolves so much around my eyes and hands, I listen far more to audiobooks than I ever um, read physical books anymore. So it's just for the sake of time. So I can still ingest a ton of information and still get work done at the same time while um, when it comes to reading, uh, you know, so most of the books I own now, most of the books I should say that I've bought now, I own still a bunch that are good old fashioned books, but uh, the vast majority now that I buy are art books, you know, visual aids, or books for inspiration. As uh, if I have to read anything or I want to read anything, I almost always just go for audiobooks. Audible is awesome. If you guys haven't joined Audible, like <laughs> there's no sponsorship here, but I just recommend them. They're awesome. I love my Audible account. So cool. So useful. Love it. University from a 300 page book by Victor Paplian. Yeah. Um, what are my thoughts on anatomy for sculptor book? Um, I feel like I've seen it. I don't know if I don't think I have it. I don't think I have it. Um, but I know I've seen it. Uh, but I honestly can't remember it. I mean, so much, I've seen so much anatomy, dude. That's the other thing. Like, I've, <laughs> cause I've studied medicine for years. So I mean, all I was doing was just like, human anatomy all the time so it's like all these different images of anatomy books are just like it's all cluttered up here you know it's just nice to have some specific reference of course but it's like a lot of the basic anatomy and the flow of muscles and everything it's pretty it's pretty burned in um, but if i want to get like this precise you know like the obliques are always kind of a little i still find them a little confusing at times like how the flow they're beautiful but it's just like there's a there's a there's a flow to how they kind of like weave into each other you know and uh I still I haven't done it enough and cared enough to be like oh I have to get the obliques just perfect without looking at reference. Nah, I'm I, I'm not that obsessed with. Um, I just don't I don't do a lot of human figures that much. You know, I guess lately I've been doing more, but um, I like animals more, so I just I just don't work a lot on humans. But I've studied so much anatomy. Um, the, all the pictures in the books, man, they all blur together. It's hard for me to think of anatomy imagery from one book versus another. Um, there's another great book I have that's for animal anatomy. I think it's I think it's by the same, either by the same artist or publisher, or it could just be that everyone just talks about both of them. But let me grab it for you guys quick, and I'll show you guys. It's great for animal anatomy. It's iconic. A lot of people have used it for decades. Okay, so um, I lied. <laughs> it's not by the same guys at all, but it uh, has the same title, basically, <laughs> except for animals. So it's uh, an Atlas of Animal Anatomy for Artists. And this is what it looks like. You guys can take a screenshot, or I can type it up in there. But they show the skeleton of a horse, and it is by... W. Ellenberger and H. Dietrich and H. Baum, edited by Lewis S. Brown, 288 illustrations. And it's just, you know, it's just a plethora of all kinds of animals, their bones, their muscles. This is where, if you guys have seen like the famous, um, very popular now, uh, lion models that have gotten out there, this is where they got a lot of their anatomy, the anatomy for dogs. You've got the muscles for dogs in there. I mean, the ligaments, the muscles there, everything. Just It's just an amazing reference. Phenomenal reference. So, yeah. If you guys need a solid, always available reference of animal anatomy for like a lot of the popular animals, big cats, dogs, 
cattle, livestock. Just amazing stuff. Um, you know, there you go. It's just a, just a bunch of goodies in there, man. A lot of, a lot of livestock. There's some deer. There's a deer skeleton. Venison. Uh, more horses. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, so it's not like every animal known to man or anything, but an atlas of animal anatomy for artists. Look it up. Great. Great book. A picture. <laughs> there was a cow. A picture of me. What? <laughs> Terrible. Self-deprecating humor. Um... Couldn't have the stomach to witness what? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm missing a bunch of stuff here. Um, oh, wow, they even performed a live anatomy autopsy on real human corpses in university. Yep, so we did too. Male and female. Only tough students went to that class. That's funny. Couldn't have the stomach to witness. Uh, X Music 12. Oh, it's got the PDF. Cool. Yeah. It's, I know it's hard to find or it's sold out all the time or it's not even, I don't know if it's even published anymore. So I'm not advocating piracy by any means, but if you guys can't find it anywhere or if you're across the world, if you're poor at this point, I mean, a PDF of an art book, it's like, dude, share away. <laughs> we need more great art in the world. Um, Such expressive anatomy. Horses are amazing. Yeah, horses are gorgeous animals. Yeah, absolutely. Have you ever done animal modeling? Why do you own these books? <laughs> yeah, I've done I've done uh, much creature modeling for sure. Um, I'm working on a dog right now for a magazine article. Actually, you'll I guess I'll be allowed to show it when it's done. Um, I'm working on a dog. A dog's like done already, but he's just being posed. He's going to be in a car, <laughs> driving the car. Um, yeah, they're great books. Um, yeah, I found them on Amazon, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I found them on Amazon a while ago. Um, where did I put my stylus? Oh, here it is. Okay. Anyway, sorry, tangent. Yeah. So right now I'm just kind of carving in, and you know, it's a little hard in here. It's like I'm going a little strong in there, but I'll uh, smooth it out here as well. But yeah, right now it's just doing some basic stuff with the uh, Slash 3 brush and um, the uh, Art Anatomy book. I bought these books years ago. I'm talking like probably now 10 years ago or more. Um, I, you know, it's just been an artist my whole life, but... Um, you know, it was a hobby for a while, and then it became my profession. And somewhere in the journey of it becoming my profession, very early on, I found out who were the, who was, what were some of the standards to always have on reference. You know, what's what's some of the um, most iconic, you know, books to have, and these were some of them. So that's why I wound up with them. Um, yeah, and I just I love animals, so I was gonna have books on bio i mean like you know i loved animals i love zoology um in high school i just loved animal animal science right it's just like a more specific honing of uh biology and zoology um yeah so my life is surrounded more with elements of creatures and animals than it is about uh humans like a friend of mine sent me it's funny a friend of mine the other day sent me a facebook uh message being like dude have you seen this guy's work and it was some guy who um uh some artist who creates these really um i guess you could say charming or nostalgic um models like 3d you know i guess 3d printed or sc he sculpts them and then molds them to look like authentic uh um vintage 1960s through 80s like action figures of superheroes and uh, my friend, my friend who sent me them is a great guy. Like I love him; he's awesome. Um, it's but that's it's like he's a little bit older than me, and I think that's more his like childhood, teenage nostalgia. And for me, you know, plus as as being a really like 
you know. Uh, I hate saying critical because that sounds so negative, but I mean, I'm a very just detail oriented person. I'm a very nitpicky when it comes to the visuals of things, the aesthetics of a model, you know, of, of something I'm creating. I, if I have any time, I'll just go into insane levels of detail and realism and, and accuracy and epitomizing like glorifying whatever I'm working on to make it look as great as I can, you know, and as attractive as it can be. Uh, and so I aim for like glorifying a brand or whatever. And so when these figures, they look so stiff and just like, you know, very clunky and just like old school, like, just like, you know, vintage models, vintage toys did back then. Just not, not great works of art, just, just cheap toys is kind of what they look like. Um, but this guy was making them modern day, you know, uh, for people to enjoy, for people who are, I guess, of that generation that really grew up with them and love them. And I, I get that. I mean, I get that there's this attachment, this is nostalgia, you know, for a lot of people connected to old toys. But for me, I'm just like, if it doesn't look like a masterful work of art, I'm not going to really be a fan of just like humanoid human characters. Anyway, so yeah, so I was just like, meh, thanks, you know, it's cool to see, but I'm, you know, we're different generations here, so I'm not going to be able to appreciate it like someone like he. And, uh, but for me, I told him like, you know, I'm, there's very few human characters from pop culture that I really enjoy, honestly. I mean, the Matrix, love that, love the story. It's like the story makes the characters great, you know, usually. It's not the, just the design of the look of the characters. Um, Resident Evil, I love the, like, the Resident Evil characters, but it's because, again, the story was just the original games, you know, the first the first few were just great. Um, they still make, I mean, I love to enjoy all the Resident Evil games, actually, but um, for the most part. But, uh, the first, I mean, like, man, those, the memories I have from, like, the original PlayStation 1 days playing, like, Resident Evil 2 and Code Veronica on the Dreamcast and um, the remake of 1 on GameCube. Like, there's beautiful games, um, well done, like, atmospheric, and just kind of, in, you, those characters endeared themselves to you. And the movies are horrible. Movies are no representation of the, the stories, games. I feel like if they would have followed the game stories verbatim, they would have made way better movies. Um... But I think that there were some legal matters there that I learned about that um, didn't allow um, they didn't allow a lot of the uh, studios to um, have the rights to uh, to make the movies um, like the games. So yeah. Anyway, so yeah, there's not a lot of human characters I'm a big fan of. I love just creatures. So, so I, as a kid, I was a huge Jurassic Park fan. And I, before Jurassic Park came out, I was just a massive dinosaur nut. Um, so I, uh, I was a bigger fan of Phil Tippett's work before, he, before I ever knew he worked on Star Wars. I mean, I knew the work of Star Wars. I knew Star Wars, but I never knew really who made the AT-AT walkers and the ATST walkers and all the stop motion, the Tauntaun. I love the Tauntaun. So Phil Tippett did this great set of stop motion um dinosaurs that looked very realistic like super realistic for their time and they still look great um and it was for this this um cbs special called just dinosaur and it was hosted by the late christopher reeves from superman fame and uh they used phil tippett's um work in that show to create these very gorgeous realistic dinosaurs like hunting each other and just you know living life kind of like what walking with dinosaurs popularized but there's still something that looks almost more attractive about something you know that's physically real, that's lit by real light, and it's um they made them big. I mean, they were still like I saw the real things. I got to meet Phil. Like I kind of know him generally. I mean, we you know we we've interacted a couple times, and he's invited me to the studio a couple times, and uh, so I got to tour Tippet Studios and just see all the original stuff. I mean, like stuff from Willow, stuff from the dinosaur um, shorts that he made, um, stuff from Jurassic Park, stuff from the uh, I mean, when I'm saying stuff, I mean, sorry, that's such a terrible word to use. Props and maquettes and all the physical elements that were used, like even the original mold for the original Tauntaun from Star Wars. I held it like I got to touch it and see all this incredible work. Um, the stop motion puppets he used for the animatics for Jurassic Park, saw all of that. Um, he's selling it now, I think. It's actually up for auction, which is kind of sad. Um, he actually had some of the physical giant... Uh, mandibles from the um, Starship Troopers bugs, like the ones that spear people and all that. It's just like crazy awesome movie history stuff. Like I got to see all of that. And Phil is just a, he was just a great guy. I mean, he is a great guy, but I mean, he was just really kind to me and, um, you know, just got to have lunch with him a bunch of times and his, his coworkers. Just a really, just, just, we connected and he's just a great, a great guy. I really respect him and really am just thankful that he is 
touched my life so much positively as a child and now as an adult my career is in line with what he does um so yeah just being able to get to see all that man that was just uh yeah it was just crazy inspiring and really um just something that really was just rewarding for me to experience but you know he was the one who created all these creatures that i loved there was never really people it's never really human characters because i've always feel like a superhero you know male or female they're still just the human figure just just like with a greek god form like this you know and that's fine like all right whatever <laughs> i'm like rolling my eyes because i'm like oh great wow look another cut human character never seen that before it's just it's just like it's i don't know i i need novelty i need originality a little bit more i mean nothing's original i know i mean but you know what i mean like just i want to see stuff that really stimulates my brain that i i can really be appreciative of that's not something that we see in the mirror every day i mean not again not that i'm cut like a greek god by any means at this point in my life but i've worked with so many human forms like studying the human figure for medicine working on real people in the er and then also studying life drawing models and drawing them like insane volumes and numbers hundreds of hours um that the human body just it's like it's amazing it's an amazing biological machine it's incredible and yet i'm also very bored with it uh, <laughs> overall so that's my my long-witted stupid explanation for um for why I just I love creatures far more. I just feel there's so much more variability and, and, and elements to explore and marvel at. And it really feels like we know less about animals than we do about ourselves, which makes total sense. Um, yeah. So anyway, so that's my that's my shtick on. Uh, my interest on animals versus. People. I think. A lot of people say other people will not take an interest in stories or films that revolve around a character that's not a human or not humanoid, doesn't look and talk and act like a human. I beg to differ. I mean, I'm sure I know there are people like that who are like, if it's an animal, they look at animals as just lesser than human or lesser than um, not worth their time or their compassion or worth their interest. And that's fair. You know, I mean, I get it. Everyone has their preferences. Mine is more animal, but um I think that they're also shortchanging themselves, though, if they don't want to, um, you know, want to take time to enjoy and explore the amazement and the beauty of nature and the natural world and the natural order of things. I mean, because biologically, we are animals. I don't think our minds, obviously, I wouldn't call us completely animal because our brains are far superior, um, obviously. But I mean, then again, I look at how whales and elephants and, and um, you know, cetaceans, whales and dolphins and all those um, sea mammals and uh, elephants, you know, how they grieve. All these animals, they have a sense of, of um, they have a sense of understanding of sentience and life and death. And, um, you know, I mean, so people would make the kind of lame argument like, who's to say they're not more smart than us? They're not having wars and they're not, I mean, granted, they don't have thumbs and they also don't have the ability to make things the way we do, unfortunately or unfortunately, right? But um, uh, but still, I just think that it's it's I think it's a shame if people just sort of throw away the idea of appreciating animals in nature and just view them simply as resources to be slaughtered for food or um, just for being I don't know playthings for their children. You know, um, it really kind of saddens me when I see people just disregard animals as as lesser than um deserving of compassion or uh not deserving of interest the way that they put humans in, in a certain category is so superior to animals when i think people can be just as as horrific and terrible toward each other and and other creatures as animals can be toward those they consume which is almost like more pure you know the animals usually don't kill for sport they just kill for the defense of their own survival or you know their own survival to eat uh, while we you know, I just saw another posting that's sad of a some trophy hunter killing some beautiful elephant, young two year old male elephant. And it's like, how is this still how is this still allowed? Like how is this still legal? And African elephants are these incredible, beautiful animals and I'm like, how are they still are they endangered? Like how are we allowed to kill the brace these things? Like lions too. I think they do that with lions. How is that still like allowed, man? It just seems so it just seems so cruel and so sad. These animals just don't know what's going on, and and you're not even going to eat these things. I mean, right? You're just going to like 
to make them trophies, just gonna stuff them? Like, dude. It'd be more way more respectable if they spent the kind of money they're spending to kill a living thing and then stuff it to just hire a special effects company to build you a beautiful because it's going to feel fake anyway right it can look extremely real but they still feel fake you know anybody if you've ever touched a stuffed animal a preserved animal um they don't feel real you know they look real but they feel like preserved they feel like hard rigid crusty not real so it's like why not just you could get a special effects company like legacy effects to make you an incredibly realistic creature probably for around the same amount of money you'd spend to fly to africa pay for all your weaponry kill the animal gut it transport it preserve it set it all up for your you know trophy room you could probably i'm sure it'd be around the same price to, to have a special effects company build you an animatronic or at least a, just a static model that you could even touch and probably even be soft to the touch it would feel like there's muscle underneath the bone underneath the skin um as opposed to how you know uh, stuffed animals and for anyone who's researched this too like stuffed animals often look sometimes turn out horrible taxidermed animals like there's a whole you can, i'm sure a lot of you've seen this like there's memes online all over the internet of uh <laughs> of horribly managed um stuffing of, of animals preservation of animals and it's just there's this famous one of a fox that it's sitting and it looks terrible and people have done it to their dogs and other things and it's just they turn out horribly and um it's like man why not <laughs> you might get a you know in the end of the day you could get a stuffed animal that looks worse than um one made by a visual effects company or i mean a special effects company you know so anyway i don't know end of rant sorry i just uh I love animals, and I think if we can uh, keep them around longer and treat them well, I think if you teach kids at a young age to love nature and love animals, that's, that's how it got me. But it wasn't that my folks really forced it on me so much or anything. It was just, um, I'm drawing muscle straight, sorry. Um, <laughs> I think it was more just uh, having a dog at a very young age, growing up in a house with with a dog and cats and um more for some reason like just being fascinated with amphibians and having a tank full of toads and newts and frogs and watching tadpoles metamorphosize from tadpoles into frogs i don't know it just captivated me as a child having a tank full giant 20 gallon tank full of fish started with a small 10 gallon the, the, the goldfish got bigger so we had to upgrade our tank and the thing got to like a foot long so we had this foot long giant goldfish um <laughs> His nickname was the pig because he just ate like a pig, but I think we called him Mister Mister Hugs. I don't remember something weird, some cheesy name. Um, but yeah, the pig is what stuck because he was just this force of nature in this tank that would just <laughs> just eat and eat. Um, him and a couple other like fish we had for years. I don't remember exactly how long, but I feel like we've had that one goldfish for like at least twelve years, I think, or thirteen years. All of our animals in my parents' house I grew up with were just, um, they just lived abnormally long lives because they were very loved and well taken care of. I mean, we had, uh, I think we had some cats pass away at like 17, 18. Uh, my mom's dog, who we, that she's had for a while, just died at 18 years old. Oops. Um, so yeah, our, we just love our animals in my house as a child. Anyway, sorry, I'm missing a bunch of chats. I'm just ruminating. I'm just reminiscing um uh do you find brushes behave differently through different versions of zbrush I use uh i use r8 and i swear it feels different than 2019 to 2021 oh r8 okay version four wow you're on an old old version um well first of all you should buy zbrush i'm assuming you're using a, a pirated version if you're still on r8 uh yeah i'm sure they change over time probably a little but um feels different than twenty so you use R eight. Why are you using R eight? Is it because the brushes feel different? Because you can change settings in brushes, you know, to make them feel like uh current, you know, or like the past if you want to. But I don't think they change that much. I don't think so. I mean, I think a lot of the code for a lot of them has, has stayed the same, if I'm not mistaken. Um But it's just my two cents. Um Better way to use reference instead of books. Use Sketchfab or Turbo Squid. Really detailed models you can use them for. Us. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, 
<laughs> wow, people aren't aware of Turbo Squid. Yeah, man, Turbo Squid has tons of models out there for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, and you did ZBrush. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you're still coming in here. Um, Team of Animatronic for Jurassic Park still looks more realistic in CG. Yeah, of course. Able to hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the animatronics from Stan Winston's studio back then, man, they were, they're still, they really haven't matched them. I mean, I guess they kind of made versions of them for each film slightly here and there, but that full on T Rex, man, that's like, that's still probably the, one of the best animatronics I think we've ever seen made. Like, so fluid and realistic, just incredible, a masterpiece. Animal versus people fight. <laughs> uh,. Sculptures made huge oversized muscles in Florence. Um, if this live or recording, this is live, dude. Undead. Uh, a lot of places it isn't allowed to the point of basically having anti poacher mercenaries. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that. Bad taxidermy up. Nature's wonderful human shrug. Uh, was referred to January 6th. <laughs> uh, can you explain oblique muscles? I mean, how they are shaped. Um, to explain why they're not using the current version of Z-Rush. Um, download of Pixelogic. You're a lie now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, guys, if you don't have a current version of Z-Rush, I'm assuming you have a pirated version because there's no reason why you shouldn't. There's I don't understand why you wouldn't upgrade because all the new versions have such better features. Um, I know it's not cheap. I mean, cheap in relative sense, but it's it's worth it. Absolutely worth it. And you get free upgrades from then on. So just save up some money. Um, I mean, I get if it's a hobby, I, I get, you know, we've all heard those reasonings. But yeah, I mean, it's still, I know the people of Pixelogic. I know the real people and, you know, this is their business. So, you know, please, uh, if you by any means you have the ability to purchase it, please do. Um, you can even subscribe too. It's subscribing now. You can get a subscription to it, which is relatively cheap. Um, um, so you're serious. You're asking about the oblique muscles and how I can describe them. I mean, I'm not sure what you want me to describe other than that they, you know, they attach, you know, at the back, <laughs> basically sides and ribs area. And then they come and, you know, they originate back there and then they insert, you know, toward the front here, toward the other end of the beginning or the center, more of the ribs, you know, and they allow you to um, do things like this, <laughs> you know. They support a lot of uh, the rib cage and give you a lot of uh, twisting motions, you know. That's basically where your twisting is. That's how you're able to twist and move all of the different segments of, you know, your body as they go up the spine. Um, they work in concert with many other muscles. Um, but yeah, they flow over. They so they weave, you know, they do this essentially. They really, they really kind of overlap each other in a beautiful way. It's an amazing, that's what I'm saying. Like a human being, when you look at the anatomy of it, it's just an amazing machine. It's really ingenious, um, biological engineering. It's incredible, you know. What I'm just doing here is holding alt and then tapping and dragging. So then it lets me do this. So it follows the normal. So normally if I hit, if I didn't hold alt and I just I did the same motion and I just took the move, it would do that. So it's going sideways. But if I hold alt and then pull pull again the same direction, I'm still moving my brush, my, my stylus in the same direction, but it's coming out. 
so it comes toward the camera. So that's great when you know the shape of something in general and you want to pull that um, form away from the normal, the surface normal, right? So surface, normal, right? That's how the normals work for those who don't know. The normal is like the outward facing side of a polygon, 90 degrees perpendicular to the polygon. So polygon, normal. That's how they work. So when you know that this is facing us and I want it to come toward the camera because I want to have more of that bulging shape for the uh, musculature, I just hold Alt and then use the move brush and just move it side to side. Move it to the right, I guess it will come toward you. Move it to the left, it'll go inward, away from you. So that's all I'm doing here. Um, oh no, what happened? Dang it, how in the hell? When did this happen? <laughs> I think this is the old arm, though, isn't it? Because I think I have the, uh... yeah, that's the old arm. Wow, I thought I deleted that. Okay, that's weird. I thought I deleted that. Wow, that happened a long time ago. Okay, uh, what to do, what to do? I guess I do have to delete that. Um, I guess I could just hope and pray... So here's a lesson for you. If you're trying to do this kind of work and you find that you have something like that in your model, uh, go to the highest level. Hopefully we don't have any weird triangles that formed in the meantime. Delete lower. Uh, do a quick save here before any of that actually. Shit, sorry. I'm gonna delete that arm. What we should be able to do in theory is uh, delete that geometry and then reconstruct subdivisions down. So that should work just fine because I want to keep the subdivision so we can go and do grosser movement, large scale movement with lower poly count. So the cage is easier to manage than uh, this high res version. Uh, what else am I missing here in the chat? Hard for people to explain. Oh, yeah. Uh, slash damn standard versus damn standard. Why you choose one over the other? A little struggle making them like the kind of shapes they form. Yeah, they're not easy. I don't think obliques are an easy an easy muscle group to just play around with. They're pretty complex, interesting forms. Um, okay, so what are we doing here? We wanna do uh, delete hidden, not split hidden, delete hidden, delete hidden, and reconstruct subdivision, please work. Yes, good. Yes, <laughs> I feel the power, there we go. Um, <laughs> Now we're gonna do one more. Yeah, all right. Righteous, righteous dude. All right, there. So now we've gotten rid of that extra arm. The other one there, that's gonna overtake it later. And yeah, obliques are looking decent. I think I might do a little tweaking. Just, just do a little a bit more of a curve to them. Um, what else am I missing here? Uh, big variations among professionals in whether or not they work in dynamish or versus topologize meshes. Um, I mean, it depends what you're doing. Um, spike utter <laughs> so yeah uh between professionals yeah i mean if you're i don't know i don't use dynamesh a lot anymore i mean i still do now and then if you want something to have kind of uniformly smoothing melting sort of form when you you know pooling together different forms or if you just want to play free form and just model and just sculpt and just keep adding topology but you can also do um uh sculptures pro you can you can in initiate that so then it keeps adding topology and keeps tessellating as you're you know um modeling and continuing that um so there's there's at least like at least two to four or five different ways to do almost the same operation in, in zbrush now just like there was in uh like photoshop or is in photoshop there's all these different methods you can do to get from point a to point b that will have the same or a very similar end result. Some may be faster, more efficient than others. Um, but Dynamesh is definitely one that's, um, Dynamesh is an option for bullying together or sculpting perpetually, um, you know, with all types of, uh, 
different forms, but um, yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know. Uh, a lot of people who are doing three D printing will use Dynamesh at some point to seal everything up or make it manifold. But also, you can do live boolean. Live boolean is what I often go with now, where I I use live boolean more because I want to make sure that certain tolerances or shapes are held exactly in place or as much as possible. And so doing live boolean and having the boolean together different meshes will ensure that the topology outside of the moment or point of intersection is unchanged. So everything else in topology stays the same except for where those points are intersecting. When they intersect, that's where welding happens and there will be some minor modification to the topology. The minimal amount of modification that is needed to join these polygons and these polygons. And if there's a desperate level of change, then you'll see more polygons, you know, like added and, and you'll see them triangulate out. Um, but uh, you'll still see uh, the majority of our topology that's not intersecting anything else will stay exactly as it was beforehand, before it was booleaned together. So um, live boolean is my preference, unless I really need some sort of smoothing or there's some weird funky issues because something's so detailed where I just have to like, do almost like a shrink wrap kind of effect to it. Then I might do a mixture of like Dynamesh and NZ, uh, Boolean, um, Live Boolean. Um, Z Remesh is another, it's not a way to combine, but it's a way to re -topologize. Um So yeah, there's all this interplay between those different algorithms, basically. Um, so it really depends what your needs are as a professional, what you're working on, whether it's like a, something to be 3D printed, whether it's something that's, um, you know, has to be animated. Um, is it UV'd yet? Is it not? You know, does it matter? All those things come into consideration when you're um, or considering uh, Dynamesh versus another method. Um, ZBrush Princess, thanks for giving out helpful tips. I'm not sure what exactly I gave. I'm the <laughs> behind here on the uh, chat. Excuse me. Sorry. Um. <clears throat> But you're welcome. <laughs> uh, why use slash three instead of damn standard? Um, it's just preference, I guess. I think damn standard kind of pinches together while it does it, while flash three just sort of like just just cuts in. I think there's, I think that's the main difference. Um, so you get weird with normals not facing the right way. Yep. Um, lol. Use all the brushes by accident and discover new stuff too. Yeah, always mess around with different brushes, guys. Don't be afraid. You know, try stuff out, experiment. It's it's great. If you don't know what it does, YouTube check. Check it out on YouTube or um, you know, look at the documentation. Um, I think it's like ZBrush. It's docs d o d o c s dot ZBrush or ZBrush Pixelogic. I forget. Just Google ZBrush docs. ZBrush DOCS, and you'll find the documentation online for the latest version of ZBrush and all the subcategories of every single element of ZBrush you'd ever want to learn. Um, it's amazing how many people don't do that, but so many, so many people do not look at the documentation for a program when something like Pixel, someone like Pixel Logic, they do a really good job of documenting tons of all the information, really, I think, of everything you'd want to know. So it's like, there's not really an excuse to not know how to use certain things if you want to learn them. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, searching the documentation, you know, you can get a lot of great information out of it. Um, anyway, uh, what else do we got here? Uh, use alt and brushes by accident and discover new stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, the standard does, yep. Uh, like an old auto save. Yeah, that's that's not fun. Um, do you recommend rigging with lowered subdivisions method for posing in ZBrush? Rigging with lowered subdivisions. Yeah, definitely lower subdivisions. You don't want to try to rig anything high subdivision. That's just a pain. Um, have I used real? Um, I'm trying. You're trying to say reference. Have you used real reference muscles for this pose? Oh, oh, um, no, not really, no. Um, but I am looking at someone who did draw the muscles actually in this near exact pose. So the muscles I'm using right now that I'm referencing for the pose I'm looking at is nearly identical to the reference in the book. So that's that's really useful. 
because that's the other thing. So you can look at references for 3D on Sketchfab or find stuff on TurboSquid, but if it's not rigged, you're not going to get accurate muscle shifting in the right pose, right? So it's either better to this still where it's like, unless it's rigged and you have it in Maya and you're going to pose it and all the muscles are going to, those will be expensive models, by the way, if you're going to try to download those, buy those models from TurboSquid, you're going to be paying hundreds of dollars, if not even a thousand something for one of those really detailed, accurate human anatomy models where all the muscles are rigged accurately to just to, you know, to move with the skeleton. Uh, so a much a more affordable and more immediate way is just to Google a pose, you know, of what you're looking for. Um, and I know there's some art sites out there that have like tons of nude models that are in poses specifically for artists. Um, I can't remember them because I don't really use them at all, but I've seen and heard people talking about them a lot. So I know they're out there. Um, Q, I know, you know, a bunch of you guys are making sick jokes or about to right now. <laughs> like, oh, I know the sites too. Yeah, yeah. And that's what I'm, not, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actual <laughs> art sites um, that have models for drawing. Um, juveniles. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, it's Google googling certain poses you know and or people like working out like different different photos of like workout routines where they're lifting weights and doing you know certain poses like that will show you a lot of muscle um differentiation and and diversity of um poses and whatnot that's that's very useful um but yeah so if you want to spend like i don't know maybe a thousand bucks or a few hundred on a model that's got the rigged muscles you know that could work um or if you have, you know, the knowledge and the time to make your own model and then do all the muscles and and then download and install and learn how to use uh, Zevia or Ziva, Ziva Dynamics. It's something I was interested in and I had for a while, but just didn't get into it. So I, I canceled my subscription to them, but I'll probably go back eventually because they're working on some really amazing facial rig stuff. But Ziva Dynamics is this incredible plugin for Maya that solves for muscle tissue movement. So when you have, um, say, like an area as complex as the obliques and you're doing a twisting motion, it will solve for how the skin will deform over the muscles following that basic animation. It'll do all that for you. But you also have to put input like, you know, place of origin, place of insertion, um, give it a volume. So you still have to model the muscles to some degree and place them, but then it'll do all the rest of the calculation and simulation. You won't have to like inflate every muscle or try to move them all around to make it look like you don't have to keyframe all those animations. You just do the main motions and the muscles will follow suit with their according tolerances and, and um, parameters that you've designated. So there's still a bit of like manual work involved, but the end result is so much more realistic and f still faster than trying to keyframe, you know, um, a muscle system that it's incredible. Like if you look at the animations done and with the simulation animations done in Ziva Dynamics um, animations versus someone that you know didn't use that and try to keyframe it and manually do it, night and day difference. Like you really feel like they motion captured muscle, like they motion captured the skin, the real fine detail of something moving versus, um, you know, old school keyframe animation. So uh, something to check out if you guys are ever looking into doing muscle uh, and, you know, simulation with muscles moving underneath the skin, Ziva Dynamics is definitely something I think I'd, I'm going to use eventually. Um, and I think a lot of people should. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Um, <laughs> no, change is bad. Stay in your nutshell. Art station has references, reference packs from people deviant to deviant art too. Yeah, yep. Anyway, um, seems like we don't have as many people today as we usually do. Wonder if they just have lost interest or forgot or like, oh no, it's Daniel. Ugh, screw that guy. He's just working on that same PC he's always working on. Never ending Cupid Psyche piece. Ugh.
Is it helpful to learn real life drawing before getting into anatomy of characters? And yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm a huge advocate for that, but that's also probably biased because that's, you know, that's how I started too. It was traditional, classical, you know, life drawing, graphite and pencil and, and graphite and paper. Um, yeah, but I mean, I, I completely advocate for if um, if someone's just trying to get into sculpture, I mean, it, it all it all adds together, right? I mean, the uh, the cumulative effect is that your brain just understands form better, right? You're you're learning how to accurately observe and re replicate whatever you know you're trying to reproduce. Um, so you always have to look at your subject like at least ten more times than you are looking at your own paper or your own work um that's just like a you know old classic standard of art and replicating anything it's just you have to look so much more at your subject than your uh, you'll get your reference so much more than your your own work um if you're trying to represent obviously something in the real world so yeah yeah drawing definitely it's definitely a positive <laughs> so much great information. I hope it's helpful. This depends, you know, where you are on your journey, too. I think for anyone who's more senior, this will probably be rather maybe repetitive or even boring, <laughs> sadly. Uh, but uh, for those who are maybe earlier on in their journey in the arts, this is, yeah, hopefully this is helpful. But yeah, you know something that can help anybody is just to stay motivated man you know stay encouraged stay inspired shake things up if you're in a rut sometimes i found that it's even if you don't feel like making art just force yourself if you don't feel like doing it just force it and then put on some music that you enjoy and before you know it you may be um maybe really enjoying what you're doing by the end of your your effort and then sometimes too yeah you know what it's good just to walk away um good to walk away get some fresh air go out on a hike or run or just a walk go see something of nature get away from a computer if you can leave your phone behind just like get away and maybe don't leave your phone behind just in case an emergency but <laughs> uh but yeah get outside get away from a computer and your whole subject matter and then come back or even go to sleep you know whatever if it's late and you just want to go to bed and you're forcing yourself to stay awake like i do a lot sometimes it's better to say screw it go to bed get your sleep wake up feeling refreshed let yourself ramp up through the day naturally don't push yourself if you don't have to and then when you're ready sit down and get back to your project and by that moment then you'll probably feel you'll see things with new eyes you'll be refreshed and uh you'll probably have much more success and be more satisfied with what you produce then than you would have if you would have just forced it um earlier you know so that's something else to um to keep in mind um, someone who's been been around the block. Um, yeah. Uh, researching a lot of human anatomy before I start my Zebra's journey. I really love and want to see with Zebra's 21. Do a bit of sculpting and 3D printing, just hobby level. And I've got to say that Trico sculpt and print was just outstanding. The feathers were insane. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> uh... What's up? What does that say? Tal or Tahedon? Tahedon? Hello. Uh, what music do you listen when you're working? Uh, <laughs> I listen a lot to electronic music. Um, right now I'm actually listening to, I was, was listening to the Paul Oakenfold as usual. Uh, Paul Oakenfold's, um, a weekly pod not podcast weekly radio show just mixes a whole bunch of djs together from all over the world um but it then it automatically on soundcloud it automatically will flow into um other artists so then it went on to solar stone so solar stone um presents pure trance radio episode 269 that came out like a day or two ago 
And then that transitioned naturally over into Transmission Festival. Uh, it's from Prague and the Czech Republic. Um, so specifically, I'm listening to Cortai Organ Transmission Live. So I'm listening to right now. I, just, I haven't really been paying attention. It all just flows almost like seamlessly as progressive trance does into itself. Um, so I just sort of went into this one. But yeah, normally um, you can find me listening to either Paul Oakenfold's mixes where I find all these other DJs, um, which leads me down all kinds of random, you know, um, bunny trails. Or um, I listen to a lot of like 20th century classical as well. Uh, which ranges from 20th century classical to a lot of soundtracks, a lot of movie and game orchestral soundtracks, full orchestras. Um, and then random stuff, you know, I'll find. I mean, of course, I like some of the classic stuff too, like a lot of music from the 90s and before, you know, I'm a fan of, uh, of basically everything that was in general. I like a lot of music that was popular from the early 2000s and back. 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s even. Um, I like music from all those decades of all genres pretty much. But uh, as time has progressed, I find my taste, as you get older, I think you find your niches and you kind of like you find your things. And for me, it's definitely like the two big camps of my music tastes are electronic slash like industrial. So think stuff that was like on the Matrix soundtrack and then like a lot of trance fun like rave dance music um i just like fun exciting positive music um that keeps you motivated i love jazz i like a lot of so that's more it's like a offshoot right of improv classical what are you know jazz is like its own thing but i love jazz um yeah i like good melodies so i guess that's it you know and jazz is definitely more like playful meandering of music a lot of times that maybe follows a melody but then it still goes off and has its own little thing and comes back together um so often when i'm when i'm working and uh yeah those are the three one three big ones i guess really uh it's like when i'm working sometimes i'm working here at the desk sometimes i'm working in the living room and uh i'll just put on spotify and i'll just put on like jazz classics or modern day cafe jazz or whatever um when i just kind of want something that has like positive energy but it's not too demanding of like your attention um it kind of keeps like fun background music going you know um like stuff you'd hear in a cafe because i used to work a lot in cafes for fun um like on my computers um back when i was still starting out um so i think that vibe still of it's sort of like semi-social you know like you're around people and you're seeing people work and you're having that flow and energy but you're not interacting with them so much <coughs> oh, excuse me ah, a little dusty um i think that's where my you know enjoyment of that kind of style came from I, I don't know i love jazz since i was very young um yeah so i guess those are the three big ones you know soundtrack slash classical electronic dance and like jazz um love modeling to the crystal method yeah i love the crystal method they're great i got to meet um what's his name scott scott i got to meet him at one of his last shows here um i guess it's technically redondo beach or is it hermosa that there was this place called saint rock it's not too far from here and uh saint rock was this awesome two-story ceiling um rock bar venue so it's, it was like it's like a bar restaurant but mostly a bar and uh just a huge dance not huge but a large dance floor a great little stage for the artists to perform on and they just have all kinds of big names come through there. And I saw Crystal Method was playing down the road from my apartment. I was like, dude, yes. So, um, yeah, I, I got to, to meet him, shake his hand, thank him for, for his awesome work. Uh, for his, just, I love the Crystal Method. I've listened to Crystal Method since, uh, man, I think since Keep Hope Alive came out, like back in late 90s, man. Whew, that was way back in the day. Um, what was that album? Vegas? I think that's what it was called. Yeah, I love this stuff, man. It was two of them, and then it just became Scott, I think, because the other other guy, I forget his name right now, uh, escapes me. He uh, They parted ways amicably. Um, but yeah, dude, Crystal Method's great. Classic stuff. Yeah, 
Rammstein, yeah. Du hast. You guys remember that for the Matrix soundtrack, I'm sure. Uh, I also been communicating a little bit with Rob Dugan. Very little, but um, he has an awesome... I love Rob Dugan's music. So he's a great mixture of my two favorite genres. Orchestral, full orchestra, blended with fantastic like old school hip hop beats in with orchestral and an electronic music all mixed together. He has this fantastic style of music that I absolutely love. Um, specifically his instrumental work. He'll still do some voice with it too. Some, some of the voice works, some of it doesn't for my taste, um, I think. Um, but his music overall is just freaking awesome. So Rob Dugan, he was on the Matrix album as Rob D. He created the music that it's called uh, the song is called Club to Death. Um, it plays when Morpheus is walking with Neo and he's telling him about the Matrix in the uh, the first training simulation when they encounter a, a copy of Agent Smith and then Morpheus tells Tank to freeze it and then he tells him about agents. Um, so yeah, Rob has like been a huge inspiration to me for decades now. Or yeah, and um, uh, just a really cool musician and a very cool guy um, from what I can uh, assess. Um, I'm starting my own podcast, um, uh, by the way. And so I'm planning to, I've already told him I'd like to have him on and then we'll see he's like, it's, it's okay. It's a possibly it's a maybe. Um, but we seem to get along very well and, and agree on a lot of, a lot of things. So, um, hopefully I'll uh, be able to have him as a guest here soon. My first guest is ready to record it. It's in the can. I just need to finish editing and putting some of the uh, visual elements in. Um, but then I'll have it up on, um, YouTube, SoundCloud, and I'm going to see about, uh, I have to start up a Patreon still and, um, and also see about getting it up on Apple, Apple iTunes podcasts. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to be interviewing. So my first guest is, uh, the sound designer from senior sound designer from Sony PlayStation. Uh, he is, uh, he's also worked on Sony's, on uh, some films for, um, not Sony, I guess it was, uh, Warner Brothers or Fox. I forget. I think it was Fox, 20th Century Fox. But anyway, he's a sound designer and he's a, he's a good friend. He's a great guy. Um, Derek Espino. Derek, um, he's done the sound design for uh, The Last of Us. He did the sound design for The Last Guardian, my favorite. Uh, he most recently was the senior sound designer slash director of sound for uh, uh, the PlayStation 5's uh, Demon's Souls, um, which is a big game that just came out. I haven't really even gotten to play it yet because I've been so busy. Um, but yeah, so Derek's going to be, uh, he's on my first podcast. We filmed it like right... I want to say right after Christmas, either right, right after, or right before Christmas. I forget. I think it was right after Christmas. Um, but yeah, so I, I just got to finish that up and that'll be coming out uh, and I'll, I'll plaster it all over my, my Instagram and uh, I'll put some links up and yeah. So then I'm hoping that, you know, with Patreon and some, some build up some momentum, get some followers, um, you know, people can come and start to enjoy uh, my podcast and then I'll, I'm definitely going to see if I can get Phil Tippett on and, uh, I know Matt Winston, the son of Stan Winston from visual visual effects fame, special effects fame. Um, I used to work with Matt for a while when they were just building the uh, the Stan Winston School of Character Arts before I right before I moved to LA. Um, so I sh Matt's already agreed to come on. Um, so hopefully I can still hold him to his word. I'm sure he'll I'm sure he'll be fine. I'm sure he will. Um, yeah, and then I'm just going to bring up some other icons from the visual effects industry and the and the special effects industries and medicine, you know, have some doctors on, some scientists, um, all my interests, you know, the arts and sciences really are the big ones. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to have some pretty, I think I'm going to have some pretty spectacular uh, people on the podcast. So uh, yeah, exciting, exciting times. Um, but yeah, they came up with Rob Dugan because Rob Dugan's just amazing. So he has a site, by the way. I just want to plug him because I just love his stuff. If you guys loved Rob Dugan's music, and I'm sure you do, uh, <laughs> if you like any of the Matrix soundtrack, you'll like Rob's stuff. Um, so Rob Dugan, I'll give you his uh, YouTube. And I just want to show you guys where his stuff is. Um, so this is just a totally, just because I love the dude. Uh, his music is great. Um, you can preview some of his music that he has the full length tracks that are he's working on a new album right now and it's revisiting a lot of the classic stuff that we all loved from some of it was from the matrix um and then also from music he released on his first album called furious angels 
which had some really spectacular tracks on it. But he's kind of remixing them, but with full orchestra and like a great music arranger and uh, just incredible instrumentation. Just just doing a phenomenal job. Uh, and so he has a subscription site where you can subscribe and actually hear as he releases almost monthly um, different episodes where he shows you visually and audibly how he creates some of his music and a lot of these songs. And it's just uh, it's pretty awesome. So this is his YouTube channel. If you guys want to check out Rob, um, hear some of his music. They're, it's great. I love his stuff. It's just, it's just incredible. Um, and then his subscription site. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's just subscribe.robdugan.com. Check him out. I mean, if you like his music, feel free to to uh, join his join his site, man. It's it's I, I'm obviously I'm, I'm a member and I'm not this is not promotion for anything. It's like I don't get any kickback from any of this or anything. I just subscribe because I love I love his music and I find that it's just fun, inspirational and fascinating to see how an extremely skilled musician um, works in, in, in these especially challenging times where, you know, we have to everyone has to kind of work in unique and weird different ways, roundabout ways of collaborating with um you know something like music um you know it's like you've got to record either every instrument individually and then mix it together or you know like have a socially distanced group of musicians get together i mean it's 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 that's like a challenge now man i mean there's definitely um something to be commended for being able to produce live music like that record live music like that you know um from across the world or across even a country and then have it all just kind of, you know, come to work together so well. That's that's something. So anyway, check out Rob Dugan if you like his music. I'm sure you will. Um, Remember some of the key notes from your lecture too. Remember you were speaking about how 3D printing tech has come so far. I mean, how super detailed sculptures. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, wow. So wait, where are we going back? Legions of Boom is constantly in circulation playlist. Yeah, Club to Death, both versions. Yeah, yeah. His new Club to Death version, like Club to Death 2 revised or whatever. It's awesome, dude. It's it's freaking fantastic, beautiful, it's gorgeous. Um. Sounds almost nothing like the original Club of Death because it's just filled out with with piano and orchestra and just, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, uh, oh, you met at DesignerCon, okay, um, sweet. <laughs> uh, oh, thanks, man. What is your name here? Um, Gathering Wolves. All right, yeah, Gathering Wolves. Sorry if I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know the screen name at all. I'm sorry, but uh, it's awesome. We met. Um, cool um thanks for the kind words uh my channel so yeah if you guys wanted to follow me if you want to start subscribing to my youtube channel there's not a like i have some fun making of videos on there from years ago um i haven't updated it much in a while but it's in preparation for you know my podcast is going to be on there um but if you want to follow me or subscribe to me on youtube that'd be great um let me get my social media stuff now anyway because we've got like five minutes left um sorry i want to give you guys a crotch shot there for nothing um Let's see, we can get a bit of the anatomy view. Um, but yeah, so this is my YouTube. If I'm not mistaken. That's my YouTube. Uh, my Instagram, if you'd like to follow me on there. I'm trying to grow that. I mean, we're at 2,000 something. 2,500, I think. I'm trying to go to, trying to get to 10,000. That's like the mark, you know. <laughs> um my ig just look me up at daniel line arts and uh what else soundcloud um so if you guys just want to hear the audible version of the uh audible version of the podcast this is my soundcloud so the audio version of the podcast will be there and 
yeah, I mean, that's really it. I mean, I Facebook stuff, I mean, who knows how long I'm going to stick around on Facebook at this point because I'm not a big fan of Mark Zuckerberg and all his uh, tendencies. Um, and I'm on Twitter, but I mean, it's Twitter's just, it's just for ranting at people and about politics and junk. It's not worth it. Um, and uh, I go by a different name on on uh, a different user handle by uh, Twitter anyway. Um yeah, but um, yeah, Instagram is the best place to f keep up with stuff when I post. Um, and yeah, the YouTube and the SoundClouds will be the um, the main venues, I think, for the podcast for now. And then once I establish a setup with uh, iTunes podcasts, it'll be on there as well. <clears throat> and I'll, um, excuse me, I'll also uh, have to set up a Patreon so that I uh, can sort of get some revenue to keep this going, you know, so that I can spend more time on the uh the podcast and, and just keep getting some great guests. Um, cause I, I think it'll be, you know, we had a great time. Uh, Derek and I, we had a great, we had a great talk, great interview. And, uh, I think it'll just be getting bigger and better from here. You know, first one, it's like, eh, you know, you see yourself on a camera and in conversation and everything. And you're like, Oh, I could probably curb this tweak that, you know, you see yourself and you realize like, Oh, I can refine things here, but to, to make the transition and the whole interview process a little smoother. But I think for the first go, it was, it's fine. You know, it works just, just well enough. Um, oh, sweet. Thanks for following. Um, let's see what else. Uh, can't wait till COVID is over with. I'm dying to get conventions. Yeah, I know. It's funny, right? I think there's going to be an explosion of just socialization. <laughs> there's probably going to be like the, the, there's definitely going to be a, a segment of COVID babies, but probably there's going to be a more high birth rate, I think, after COVID, <laughs> when we can all get back to, like, just meeting people again. I think there's going to be this massive baby boom probably after COVID. Um, hopefully, I think we might need it um, population-wise. Um, but, um, but yeah. Um, oh, someone's asking for uh, ArtStation. I don't really update ArtStation. It's terrible. It's just too many sites to update, and I probably should probably focus more on ArtStation. I don't even remember if I have my ArtStation as... Um, it is... Okay, it is Daniel Lion Arts. All right, here's my ArtStation. I haven't updated it in forever, but if you click on... Uh, there's this one that says Portfolio 2. If you click on that, that'll have more of my recent work in it, I think. But this is my ArtStation. I should update it sooner, I guess, but... Oh, duh, and my site. <laughs> my actual website. Er, derp. Um, that's me. That's my site. You can find all my, my stuff through there, too, um, in general. Um, but yeah, that's my art station. Old stuff. Some newish stuff. But yeah, I just... Uh, I don't update it enough, I guess. But yeah, I have some more, you know, whatever. I'm working there, I'm proud of. It's kind of older stuff, but um, <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Anyway, um, well, we're just about at time. So if anybody has any final questions, remarks, anything nice to say, anything angry to say, please feel free to release said questions upon my mind, and I will be sure to block the angry people. <laughs> Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions last minute here, um, we are going to wrap up here in a moment. Ah, thought I was on the wrong brush. Um, so we got the obliques and the abs kind of done. I, mean, I think this still needs a bit more refinement, but you know, I don't want to get too crazy detailed either because this is meant to look like a stone statue, not like living flesh necessarily. So there are some, some type of moderate compromises that I'm doing here. Also, don't want the nipples to look like it's being pinched. Yeah, check out Zebra Dynamics, man. That's pretty awesome stuff, for sure. 
How should I practice for improving body and pose sculpting workflow wise? Improving body and pose. Um, well, workflow wise, all right, Hannibal, like, I guess the best way to advise that would be always start with um, silhouette, right? So the classic artistic idea is you sketch your form and then you refine it as it be, as you know your ideas become more refined. Or if, even if you have a really refined idea, you still have to start with a light sketch. So the sculptural equivalent of that would be a low cage, a low polygon cage model, right? So take, for example, uh, Cupid here. Um, if I just isolate him for a second, we just got the body. And then I go down to lowest sub D. Um, this is still isn't super low, but it's low um, relatively. Um, so starting with a low cage, I would say get your pose there, right? Get your, find your pose that you like, right? Find the energy, the emotion you want to convey. Um, that's important, right? Um, even like or reference, you know, look up references for iconic art, maybe if you know of something that might be similar. And use it as, as a general reference or inspiration, right? I mean, I was so inspired by the original Cupid and Psyche piece um, that uh, that's why I decided to create the uh, original homage slash remake of it in my my own version of it. Um, I've sure I've shown you guys before, but I can I can show for those who maybe weren't here before. Um, let's just um, hop over my site here quick. So this is my uh, this is my website, and this is some of my work. Um, there's Cupid and Psyche, the original piece, a remake of the original that was done by Antonio Canova, and it's visible in the in the Louvre still to this day. It's just a beautiful masterpiece. But the original looks much more effeminate, right, and 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 uh, androgynous, right. And I just wanted to really accentuate the male and female um, genders. So if you look up uh, Psyche revived by Cupid's Kiss. We go to images. So, like this is the most iconic, you know, um, one of the most iconic shots of it. You know, you'll see, you know, and it's a, it's a moderately big piece. You know, it's it's not life size exactly, but close. Um, this guy, but anyway. So I was I was I just always found this inspiring. Um, and you know, you just look at the uh, the forms. It really kind of tells a tells a story. Um, So I just thought it was so beautiful and romantic. And uh, yeah, so that's where, you know, you look at classics, look at the masters, you know, what, what is that phrase? Like, good artists copy, great artists steal, right? Um, so, I mean, borrow from the masters, man, you know? Like, look at the uh, look at the best work out there for whatever you might like to imitate or emulate, um, you know, whatever moves you. And then observe how those poses are done. and um, start start with a low start with silhouette say so where think of think of it like almost like a skeleton like where are the joints positioned you know where are the hard points at and then how do the soft forms hang off of that because it's all gravity right it's all affected by gravity or te or tension under gravity right so like your muscles contracting while resisting gravity right so there's always that motion of someone's pulling something you see them against gravity you know they're taut because they're pulling the opposite direction of gravity wherever force is you know being the opposing force so think about those you know energy transfer weight distribution drama emotion accentuating that uh glorifying that you know like really think of it in those terms so i think start with pose silhouette and then build from there, right? Build the layers up then of like, all right, I got the pose right now. How are the muscles going to be contracting or relaxing? Or, um, you know, where is the, yeah, you want this expression or you want this emotion, but where and how is the neck and head going to be posed where then that expression is most accentuated? Because you can be angry, but if you're showing someone angry from this view versus this view, there's a big difference, right? And how that it conveys the emotion and the idea to the viewer, to the audience. So that can be both in pose and or in camera placement if you're talking about rendering something out or camera movement, right? If you're talking about like animation um, and also, of course, in the movement of the character. So there's all those elements to take into consideration. But to script, uh, uh, <laughs> scripture, sculpturally talking, um, yeah, uh, that's that's where I would start, I guess, is in silhouette and pose. And uh, then starting with like, you know, your form, your form soft brush and ZBrush, your standard brush. Um, always using the standard brush a lot. Um, like a lot of the brushes I have here are my, my go-tos, obviously. 
your move, your move topological, standard, um, clay brush, clay, clay buildup, form soft, inflate, um, high polish, planar, trim dynamic, pinch. Um, your Z modeler is super important. Um, doing any kind of modeling here, slash three. Um, yeah, I mean, and there's a handful of others I'll, I'll often go in here to pick up too, depending on the project. Z project is a good one. Um, uh, what else? Uh, depending if I need a morph target, I might use the morph targets or layers, you know? Um, yeah, so. It just varies, you know. You want to do cloth, then you got all your different cloth um, brushes here. Um, yeah. So anyway, sorry, long answer, but that's that's where I would start. Yeah, with poses, gestures. Um, uh, what else? Number one use reference. Got that part. Uh, real life. Metal material panda or oh <laughs> yeah no I worked on that that's the um, that metal the chrome panda is what you're uh, talking about uh, ZBush princess <laughs> that is a uh, real it's a real sculpture that um, I modeled fully in 3D and then um, I modeled it for Dropbox Dropbox.com that's their headquarters mascot so I was really proud to be um, hired by a uh, design firm to be the artist who uh, created it. So yeah, this is the official Dropbox mascot, which they got hounded for. It's so sad. It would have had a bigger launch, except that Silicon Valley decided during that month, just before it launched or so, to start suddenly growing a conscience and bitching and complaining about the exorbitant amounts of money that Silicon Valley was apparently suddenly being condemned for spending. As if, like, I don't know, it seems so dumb to me because I'm angry about it because it's it seems very hypocritical and also um kind of it's just like all of a sudden they care like yeah right whatever because they spend so much money on so many different things you know it's just insane and so for them to spend money on art they were just condemned by these um young very young kind of basically ignorant kids who were just out of college and suddenly thinking like oh the company is basically because they, they had certain things taken away from them because the company was making a few cuts i think they cut out like the free they cut out the free um, shuttle from the airport to work. And they also took away like uh, free dinners for anyone who stayed after five. You'd have to now stay until after 7 p.m. to get a free dinner supplied to you by the company. And those are like the few things they took away from these kids. And so these kids were like, <gasps> how could you do that to us? As if they deserved it. But spend money on a panda. And they had an old receipt that was the original quote for the panda, which wasn't the original price. And it was like around 100000 it wasn't that much in the end. It was actually far less because um, we used different techniques to make this look the way it does. Um, it was originally going to be wood, and then that changed from wood to be chrome. And then it was it's vacuum formed metalized chrome. So it's actually like a resin, a high density foam that's then hard coated with a resin and then shrink wrapped basically in like this foil, like shrink wrapped material. So it looks like chrome, but it's not actually a giant chunk of metal. Um, so it's far more, you know, affordable, far cheaper than um, actually creating a giant chunk of metal and polishing it to that, you know, to these different pieces of metal and polishing it to that. So it was a really intelligent and much more affordable way to go about and a much more responsible way to go about creating a beautiful piece of art, which looks exactly the same as it would if it was done in real metal, but for far less money and far more... Um, manageable altogether so but someone saw you know so it's just all this dumb controversy from these idiots these kids at that at, at dropbox who shouldn't have been nosing around where they you know what they were doing in the first place but so it gave a bad press so it gave the company this whole thing of like well we're going to keep the panda but use it as a reminder to not be so frivolous with our money and i'm just like oh my god uh, so it's it's a sad story because so many of us worked hard to agree on the design and then I worked really hard to create the final design and then do all these renders and and, and get prepare the whole thing for see and scene and then it just gets shit on by these assholes who just <laughs> sorry but it's just the truth and it's such a sad it's such a sad story because it was such a fun piece to work on and everybody had a good time and we were all helping them save money even but these idiots just these dumb kids just didn't didn't know what they were talking about and then blasted their mouth to the press and leaked stuff that they shouldn't i mean they should have been i hope they were fired because they shouldn't have actually said or done any of the stuff that they did um 
But yeah, so it just it's just because they were, you know, it's like a vendetta thing. It's because they were pissed off that they didn't get just a few little perks that they thought they were owed, as if they were. Um, and that's why it just didn't get a big public, like, huge launch and announcement all over the press and everything. It's because suddenly they sort of wanted to wag the finger at filterless spending in Silicon Valley. I'm like, whatever, dude. It's just... Ugh. Anyway. <laughs> it was lame. Um, anyway, sorry. Uh, last few things here. What do we got? Um, my pleasure. My pleasure to stream. Thanks, everybody, for your questions. Um, any suggestion torso a day pose uh pose a uh, mannequin a day or something i mean i would say just complete pieces you know i would say finish a piece you know do something but don't maybe don't start with something as ambitious as this where you have all these different elements and all these different parts that you want to incorporate um yeah maybe do a torso sure um if anatomy is something you really want to focus on um yeah focus on whatever part of anatomy you want like just lop off the arm or hand or the torso or you know leg whatever 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 body part you want to focus on i mean if you want to get better that way that's the way to do it for sure um everyone learns a little differently you know so um but i'm more of the kind of person who says go for a whole finish a whole piece you know like that's how i learned and that's how i stayed inspired was i had this idea or like i saw a 2d drawing or painting by someone i really respected whether it was like um justin gerard uh, was an old an old college acquaintance college acquaintance um before we parted ways and i remember seeing his work back then and being so inspired by it and then years later um seeing him at these conventions i would go to a lexicon these beautiful amazing fantasy art science fiction um artists like the best in the world would go there and show these beautiful oil paintings or these you know like truly classic art modernized and um you know whether it was stuff for lord of the rings or if it was like the stuff for c.s lewis is like narnia or uh you know just like modern classic stuff like just truly like traditional classic art um so inspiring and um anyway i saw some of his work after that or before that and uh i used that as i got his permission i said hey can i do some 3d versions of your work and he was like sure and so i used that as learning as a learning um tool so i said all right i want to learn zbrush but i need something to kind of carrot myself right to lead me into learning it so like here's a great example of um of a 2d to 3d model that i did I, I mean so this was a great learning experience for me and it's still in my portfolio because i'm i just I'm, I, I like the way it turned out it still looks nice um granted now i'm so much more skilled than even what i did with this so i can easily make her face match better like exactly like what this 2d version looks like um you know but the, i think the turtle turned out pretty good again i could i can make it look even better and make it match even more so like his his painting now but still it was just something that really um helped me grow and learn and understand how to create a 3D piece from a 2D image. Um, so I was really happy with that. Um, then I did it again for one of his other pieces. Um, same same theme of the, uh, you know, little girl or woman in, in a dress riding on the, an animal. You know, there was the uh, sea turtle, flying sea turtle, or this little slug. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was fun. So, so uh, yeah, I, I'd say, like, carrot, carrot yourself, like the carrot and the donkey, right? You know, just keep yourself goal oriented um by uh you know finding something that inspires you or that you want to complete and then you know make it and uh work hard just to make it uh you know a reality you know um these are raptors that i made for um a buddy of mine who was a senior uh animation um supervisor at ilm Jurassic Park 3 Raptors. They were the first Raptors that he worked on, the first Jurassic Park movie he worked on. And so I modeled these guys and printed them, and, and they were painted by uh, a very talented painter over in um, in England, actually, at Pinewood Studios, in the Star Wars studios there. Um, he did an amazing job painting them. It's just really accentuated all the wrinkles and detail I put into it. So really just matched, it really matched the movie. And I had them displayed, uh, this one was displayed at MIT, the MIT Media Lab, which was a huge honor um, to be able to uh, have my work displayed in MIT Media Lab. I was like, holy shit, that's, that's awesome. Um, so it was with Form Labs when we, they had their first ever summit there at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, because Form Labs, for those who don't know, it's a 3D printing company that um, was birthed out of students from MIT. They had a startup to begin out of MIT. So yeah, it was a huge honor to have some work there. So anyway. Um, Anyway, yeah, do what work do what work inspires you. You know, create pieces that you love and that are characters or creatures, 
um, that you enjoy that you would love to see, you know, in a piece and, um, you know, put that out there. Um, that's, that's the best way to learn is to say, I want to create something that looks like this and then have that idea crystallize and then l like realize what you need to learn in order to get from point A to point B. And then you in along that journey of creating the piece you want to create, you're for, you're going to force yourself to learn the techniques you need to learn in order to make it look like what you want. Um, that's how I learned anyway. So anyway, so that's my, my two cents on, uh, you know, how to learn ZBrush, just create works of art that excite you, that inspire you, um, and that hopefully, you know, touch and move other people. Um, yeah. Uh, clip some of the talk. Oh, sure. I don't mind at all. As long as, as long as it's helpful to somebody. Um, uh, so I can see you're also a classical sculptor. I mean, in a way, a uh, classical sculptor. I mean, but not, I don't really sculpt large things physically myself. I, uh, I did clay a little bit, but I, I really quickly said, well, it's so much easier to do everything in ZBrush, where it's basically like sculpting in, in wax in zero gravity, right? That's what it's really like um, versus having to set up an armature and put the armature up and bolt it to a wood plank or something and then put your clay or bulk it up with some, you know, aluminum foil and then put your clay on. And it's just like, ah, it's just so much work um, and it's messy and it needs, takes up room. And um, so anyway, uh, last few questions. Uh, this Chrome version looks fabulous. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, glue gun, melting wires, uh, classic, proposed mannequin, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot like Terminator, um, finished pieces, uh-huh. Uh, thank you for the kind words, guys. Appreciate it. Um, let's see what else. Sculpt creations that are around the internet. Also design your own characters. Uh, I do a little bit of my own design, but a lot of them I've been keeping close to the vest because, uh, it's stuff that I'm working on for either a book that I've been working on that I'll probably make into a film in the end, after all, rather than just doing a written board. Um, a lot of stuff I work on that's my own. It's actually stuff that I just is very valuable to me so I, I don't really share a lot of personally designed things i probably need to practice just designing things that i don't care so much about but that's 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 the struggle it's like i i guess i just have to produce stuff that i i know is not connected to anything i want to make anything more out of it but somehow still care about it so i guess that's my that's my challenge um Cool. Oh, yeah, my Twitch also. I guess, you know, the podcast probably will go up on the Twitch as well. So if anyone wants to follow me on Twitch, I believe it's twitch.tv slash Daniel Lion Arts. There you go. I've been doing several pieces. Okay, half a dozen or more until I hit a roadblock. I'm learning and usually start something else. Now I'm trying to devise a way to work through and finish. Yeah, I mean, that's you and everybody else, man. Everybody starts pieces and then they eventually just quit because it's too much or it gets boring. Um, don't feel bad. That's just how everyone is. I mean, that's how we all are. We all start something and then drop it or have to get back to it later. So anyway. Um, okay, guys. Well, we're at a little over time now. So um, yeah. Hope everyone had a good time. I'm, I'm glad it was helpful for some. I hope it was helpful for more down the road. Um, yeah, just let me know. If you guys have any other questions, you can email me if you really need to uh, at daniellion-arts.com. Uh, and yeah, that'll wrap it up. Uh, wrap it up. All right, guys, take care. And I'll, uh, I'll see you guys. Um, what is today? Tuesday. So I guess next Sunday I'll be streaming again. It should be, should be right. So, all right, guys, take care, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Appreciate it.